Hey, welcome to another Axe Church podcast. Glad you're with us today. If you're listening on our SoundCloud uh, podcast stream, which is called uh, Axe Church Podcast and Sermons, I believe, or maybe reverse of that, but it says both sermons and podcasts in the title. You're on our old channel, which will be ending um, eventually. So we really encourage you to go find uh, our Axe Church Sermons and Axe Church Podcast and uh, Contemplate podcast streams, um, which you can find pretty much anywhere you you get your podcast, except for on SoundCloud, unfortunately. Uh, SoundCloud does not accept uh, external uh, podcast feeds, so we aren't able to get it on SoundCloud, but really anywhere else you can go find it. So go do that if you haven't done it yet. Um, and we're here to talk uh, some more. Um, we are, if you don't, if this is your first time listening to the Axe Church podcast, uh, we are a church in Camas, Washington. Um, come check us out on a Sunday morning. We have services at 945 and 11. Our 945 service is a little more traditional with um, a teaching. Right now we're in the book of Revelation. If you're, um, I'm, I imagine he'll probably be in, in Revelation for another year at, at the rate he's at. Yeah, <laughs> but, um, and then more, our, more of a Sunday school class with, yes, with some hymns right. and that type of thing. And then our 11 o'clock service is our main service um, with more contemporary worship and um, varying sermons. Yeah. Contemporary worship. Contemporary worship. Which pretty soon won't be contemporary. Which, which sounds like something we would have said in the eighties. You know? I know. Like, yeah. Hey, they've got contemporary worship. They had a drummer. You're right. Um, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, it's 2019. So, um, yeah, come visit us for sure. It's we'd love to have you. Uh, it's you know uh, a good place to to grow and to meet people that that uh, can really. Um, serve you well and that you can learn to serve and that you can grow in the Lord and uh, know Jesus more. So that's, that's always good. It's a good community. It is a good community. We, last week we were in Billings, Montana and there was snow on the ground and snow in the air. And this week we're in Camas and there's snow in the air and possibly going to be snow on the ground. It looks pretty, it's still snowing pretty hard out there. It was supposed to be turning into rain and it didn't. And so it's, it's what, March 6th today? Yes. Something like that. Yep. So still dealing with some winter, um, but it's Daylight Savings this Sunday. Um, if you're listening to this at some time other than March 6th, 2019, please don't change your clocks back because you're probably not listening to it at Daylight Savings. <laughs> but we're going to get another hour here soon, which I am very happy about. I know you, it depends on whether you're that early person. Mm-hmm. Or that later person. So right. if you get up early in the morning and you've been and you go to work at six a.m. and you've just now been waking up and it's light outside, right? Then you're now going to be bummed out because once again you're going to work in the dark. Um, you know, but if you're the kind of person who doesn't get up super early, and I'm not saying whether I am or not, but <laughs> I'm not, um, then you're you're dealing with another hour in the afternoon, which for those of us who enjoy disc golf and other things of that kind. Um, that's going to make a, a big difference. So um, good times, good times. Today, we're going to talk about uh, something that I find interesting, and we'll see if you keep listening, if you find it interesting. Uh, we're going to talk about criminal justice, criminal justice. Which um, I have tons of experience with. Yes. Hunter has been in the criminal justice system, um, juvenile justice. It's, you know, he's got quite a rap sheet. Um, no, he I, I don't think he does. Um, as far as I know, no. Yeah, I'm pretty sure I did a background check on you, but um, which is a whole thing that I want to talk about, background checks and all these kinds of things. But, uh, you know, uh, how do we think with the mind of Christ about criminal justice? That's that's the question, because people have opinions about criminal justice. Most of you have some kind of an opinion about criminal justice. In fact, everybody seems to be... Here's, here's what I see, and we'll, I'll let you kind of... Um, give your, your thoughts on this too, mm-hmm. Hunter. Most people or many people um, in the church, out of the church, whatever, if they tend towards, um, you know, uh, a certain, oh, I don't know, political leaning, they tend to be very strict about criminal justice. Like, I want strict criminal justice. I want hard penalties. I want, you know, we, we want we want criminals to serve lots of time and, and that type of thing. Have you noticed that? Yep. So in Spokane, was that sort of the, the vibe that you had from people or? Uh, yeah. Like I said, Spokane's kind of weird. It You would think it'd be more conservative than it is. Uh, we drove through Spokane last week, by we the did, way. We did, yeah. We were there for, for about. who are remotely interested in that. Yeah, we were there for about an hour. Uh-huh. On, in a car. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, I heard lots of both. I heard lots of people who were, who 
wanted very strict penalties and a lot of people who were um, like, no, there should be some way to, you know, it should be a, a process to reintegrate people into society and, so, yeah. and rehabilitate them. I think the people fall on both sides. I, I think a lot of people fall on that strict side until like, if you, like, if you just generally are looking at it, right. And you're thinking about society being safe, or if you've been a victim of a crime, mm-hmm. you might, you might really lean hard on the criminal justice needs to be swift and sure and harsh and whatever until it's your kid or yourself or somebody else who's facing that strict, harsh criminal justice system. Then you're talking a lot more about mercy and, and, um, I, you know, I, in my situation, I deserve a break, that type of thing. So, um, as if you've been listening for a long time or you go to Acts Church, you know, I'm an attorney. And I've done a decent amount of work in the criminal justice system um, as a criminal defense attorney, uh, which is one of those things that we're going to talk about because people have opinions about criminal defense attorneys and how could a Christian be a criminal defense attorney and or how could a Christian be an attorney at all, uh, which is a different different question. And the answer is really simple. You, you can't. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Um, and kidding. so we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about um, some, of, some of these issues that come up with criminal justice, but um, I'm going to, I want to start because Hunter's coming to this somewhat fresh. He's relatively young, um, has not, you know, been arrested, hasn't been in the criminal justice system. I assume that you don't know a lot of people who have been no. in the criminal justice system. And so give me your general thoughts. Um, and then we're going to kind of work off of that, but your general thoughts about criminal justice, like wh- when you think about it, um, what, what do you think? What do you think? How do you think? Do you think we do things well? Do you think we don't do things well? I, my general uh, feeling is that we don't do things well. Um, granted, my entire perception of the criminal justice system is from uh, doing things like watching cops and reading articles that somebody shared on Facebook. So I'm not saying I feel confident so very about scholarly that. Uh, right, approach exactly. to this. Uh-huh. Um, so when you say we don't do things well, what kinds of things do you think we don't do well? Um, well, there's there's the whole race issue of uh how i don't i've seen statistics about um what percentage of our jails uh are filled with african americans you know mm-hmm. um things like that which i don't know if you want to get into that today uh sure but things like that seem uh questionable at least and then uh i just think i think we either and i'll give credit that it's a very difficult line which is why we're even talking about it a mm-hmm. diff- mm-hmm. difficult line to hold between um, keeping dangerous people out of society and punishing them for um, their crimes and doing things that will redeem people mm-hmm. from their sins. Uh, right. And and where where does the government belong in that whole situation is is very difficult. So And I think that's the question, right? Mm-hmm. What what is the point? What is the mission? of the criminal justice system, which people disagree about. What, what are we trying to do? Are we trying to remove people from society to keep it safe? Are we trying to rehabilitate people um, so that they become better citizens? Are we looking for retribution? In other words, a payment of some kind for criminal activity. Mm-hmm. You know, what those, those would be some of the big like places that people would go when they say, what is it for? Why are we doing it? Um, so you have those questions. What are, what are we doing with, with people who commit crimes and why are we doing it? And then you have the questions on the other side that you're talking about, which are more about procedure. Um, who's being arrested? Are certain people targeted more often than other people? Um, is that is that based on race, economic inequalities, um, you know, different things like that? The answer I can tell you is, you know, depending on where you are and what's going on, of course, uh, it, it sometimes it is going to, uh, it oftentimes, is going to go worse for those who are more marginalized in society than it is for those who have, say, the money and the ability to uh, hire better attorneys, uh, you know, get more leniency from, you know, the kind of one of those, it's not what you know, it's who you know. I mean, it's a system with human beings, right? right? And so you have that procedural side. People, should they be convicted or not convicted of a crime? And then you have, then you have the philosophical side uh, you know why are we why are we putting people in jail? What what are we doing it for? Right. Um, one of the big things though that I think that a lot of people don't like think about is when you commit a crime, who is it that is 
prosecuting you. And, and what I mean by that is a lot of times on TV, you'll see things like, oh, such and such thing happened. And then they say, well, I don't want to press charges. You've heard that before, right? right. So there's this like myth out there that the person who's a victim of a crime has the choice to either press charges or not press charges. Like you could come into my house and burglarize it and the police could show up and I'd say, I don't want to press charges. Like in football, Hunter. you can. Right. Decline, decline the penalty. Right. <laughs> right? Um, like, like I have the ability to decline the penalty, but the fact is, is that the way that it's looked at by the, by the government is that your crime is not against an individual. It's against the state. Mm. And so it's not you who presses charges or doesn't press charges. That's, that's a myth. The state decides whether to press charges or not, and they'll do it sometimes whether you're willing to or not. Now, there are times where if a witness isn't going to be um, helpful, the state may decide that it doesn't have enough um, to to effectively prosecute a case. And so in that sense, your I'm not pressing charges may make the state say this isn't worth pushing or there's there's a lot of factors that go into that. But the one thing that you don't have the ability to make the decision on is whether or not charges are pressed. That's still always in the hands of the discretion of a prosecutor. Okay. So I, like I said, my education on this has come a lot from things like live PD and cops. I've seen uh, victims. Usually it's like a domestic abuse situation mm -hmm, mm -hmm. where, um, you know, the, the victim says, well, I don't want to press charges. Right. And it seems like sometimes I mean, usually the cops still have to take the the abuser away, mm -hmm. but um, right. It seems like usually they they respect the victim saying that. So there's prosecutorial discretion, okay. and that's what's happening. As long as you understand that it's not really in the hands of the victim, it's in the hands of the officer or the DA or whoever okay. to make the decision. Then you get it. Like it's when you think that. I could say, I don't want to press charges. And so instantly the officers would have to take you out of handcuffs and we're like, well, they don't want to press charges. If you've committed a crime, you haven't committed the crime against me. So all it is is really the officers now have uh, a reason not to take this to the state to prosecute. They have, well, they are the state. Okay. So, the, yeah. so I mean, the officers are the state. So they're an arm of the state. So basically is a, is a piece of, I'll call it evidence, I guess. It's a piece of evidence in this whole um, investigation that would lead them to believe, okay, maybe we shouldn't prosecute this person. I would say that there are circumstances where, and of course, police officers work with the DA, right? Who is the arm of the state that prosecutes a crime. And if the DA says, for instance, in, in practice, that, look, if you, you know, we aren't generally going to prosecute, we aren't going to complete the prosecution on these kinds of cases, then officers would then have the discretion to decide, you know, or they right. know, they know because they, they work together. Right. Um, when I go and, and, and am the attorney for someone accused of a crime, I'm working with police officers and with, uh, with district attorneys to, um, figure out whether they're going to charge my client what they're going to charge my client with, what the offers are, as far as all, all that kind of stuff. It's it's a, they're a team. The, the police officers and the and the district attorney are a team at some level, right? Mm -hmm. um, they they work together. One is is enforcing the law in terms of in terms of arrest and and gathering evidence and whatever. The other is prosecuting that case and and bringing that evidence before a judge or a jury. Um, and so, yes, in both cases, you're talking about people who are an arm of the state. A crime is in their mind, philosophically, a crime is committed against the state. Now we all know that that's not really true, which is to say, when you, if you come and punch me in the face right now, you've assaulted me. <laughs> you haven't assaulted the state. Right. The state. I don't care what the state thinks. You've assaulted me. Right. And so we think, and it's, and I think it's the normal way to think that when there's a victim in a crime, that that victim has had a crime committed against them. We use that kind of language because we're normal human people who are not thinking about philosophy, the philosophy of jurisprudence, you know, and how does the law really look at it? So I think it's fine to think about things that way, but to understand the way that it's, that it works, you have to understand that to the state crimes are committed against the state. That's why it would not be, if you were brought in criminal court, the title of the case would not be David Robinson versus Hunter Croft. It would be the state of Washington versus Hunter Croft. Mm. I'm not involved, right? I happen to be the victim of the crime, but the state of Washington is the one prosecuting you okay. for a state, for, for a crime committed against the state of Washington. Okay. Um, now, whether that helps anybody to like 
understand the the way that things are thought about or not. I don't know. Uh, maybe maybe it does. Maybe it doesn't. Um, but therein, so when I'm a criminal defense attorney and I'm coming in, I am not defending the person against you. Okay. In fact, maybe the person says, listen, um, you know, I clearly I harmed Hunter in this way. Uh, you know, I punched him in the face and he lost a tooth and whatever. Maybe that person wants to make it right with you. Maybe they want to pay for it. Maybe they want to, I don't know. Um, I thought I punched you in the face. Yeah, but this time you oh, got okay. punched in the okay. face, and I'm defending the guy because I would. All right, um, and and, <laughs> and and maybe he says, "I want to, I'm going to, you know, spot polish all of Hunter's guitars, and I'm going to pay for the tooth, and I'm going to give him a big hug, and whatever." The two of you could reconcile your situation, and that would have nothing to do with the fact that I'm defending this person against the state. Okay. Right. So the state says, "I want you to go to jail for a hundred years," and I'm like, "That doesn't seem." Like, like a fair, you know, like the crime meets, of course they wouldn't do that, but have you seen my face though? Yeah, that's true. That's true. Probably 200 years. You know, I don't want to mess that up. Uh, work of art indeed, but people it, who don't know who I look at, like, what does this guy yeah, look this like? This guy must be They're super be handsome. Yeah, this guy is amazing. Oh, get ready for disappointment. disappointed, Hunter. Come oh, oh, go, yeah. go look on the website. You can see what Hunter looks like. Um, a, a beautiful young man. Shameless plug right there. Yeah, um, yeah exactly. <laughs> I'm just trying to find a way to work it in. So, the bottom line is when I'm defending this person, I'm not defending them against you. I'm not, I'm not him or her. I, you know, crime could be committed. You're more likely to have to, you know, these women that are so upset that they can't be with you because your face is so beautiful. And I'm married. Yeah, that too. I mean, they get upset about that when they find out. Yeah. So yeah. him or her, I'm defending that person against the state, which is a different thing. I mean, just from the mindset of a criminal defense attorney or even from a, the mindset of a Christian, I've got two um, jurisdictions that exist for me as a criminal defense attorney, if you want to see the mindset, right? One jurisdiction is this person and God and the individual who they've harmed, right? The sin that they've committed, the person who's been harmed and their relationship to God and their relationship to that person. That's one jurisdiction that's over here. Like God is the, is the avenger of that. We are not as, as human beings, right? He Then God empowers the state over on this other side, to uh, be the avenger or to be the one that that uh, prosecutes a crime and so on. And that's that person against the state. And so there really are, and some people are like, oh, that's just lawyer double talk. It really isn't. There really is a difference between, um, because oftentimes a vict- what a victim wants is not the same thing that the state wants. That Their, their, their uh, interests are not always aligned. Sometimes they are. Sometimes both the victim and the state want this person to say, quote unquote, go to jail for the, bury them under the jail, right? Go to jail for the rest of their life. And that's what everybody wants. And that's a, okay, fine. But there are other times where the person's like, what I really want is an apology or what I really want, you know, is for this person to replace my property and, and show some remorse, whatever it might be. Right. And the, and the victim's not really, the, the victim doesn't care about that person say going to jail or paying a fine to the state or whatever. That's not their, that's not their interest. They don't care about that. Um, and if you deal with victims, you'll find that that the state and the victim are not always on the same page hmm. um, versus my client and the state. And the state wants something maybe different, usually jail time. That's the most common, right? Jail time or probation or something like that, which doesn't necessarily help victims, right? Mm-hmm. It's not, it doesn't, it's not going to, it's not, does not inure to the benefit of a victim right in that moment. Right. Um, usually there's restitution that has to be paid and whatever, but in a lot of cases, people who are caught up in the criminal justice system don't have any money. They're, they're in a, in a lower economic, uh, situation where they don't have the ability to, let's say they burglarized your house and they jacked up, they cost $20,000 worth of damage. You didn't have insurance. And so there's a $20,000 bill. Well, if the person to do is 18 years old and has a record now. And so, so what's the chances you're going to get your $20,000 back? Right. Zero. Mm-hmm. You're not going to get it back. So how did, how were you helped by the fact that they're sitting in a jail cell for two years? Yeah. You're not. Right? The only way I'm helped is if for some reason they were going to come back to my house again. And so this way they're not free to do that. Your help, of course, your house specifically, right? Well, yeah. The state is, is the state may be saying, I don't want them to come back to anybody's house. Right. And so I'm going to pull them out of society for X amount of time, which doesn't necessarily guarantee or even likely suggest that they won't go back to anybody's house. In fact, the recidivism rates and the fact that oftentimes when young people are put in jail, they tend to, they 
tend to learn how to be better criminals, right. <laughs> not better right. people, right? It is one of the problems with the criminal justice system um, is that people sometimes, I think, go into a, a situation where, remember, it's like, you know, if somebody has a problem, you don't necessarily want to put them in a cage with a bunch of other people who have that problem. Right. It, it not, is not always going to be the best way to deal with that. Again, we'll get to that part of it in a minute. But the victim versus the state is the first thing to think about. A criminal defense attorney could, and, and sometimes maybe should, work out uh, a reconciliation between a victim and a criminal, depending on what it is. In some cases, there's nothing that can be done there. But maybe there are situations where that would be a better way to deal with it. Let's go to scripture for a minute. Uh, Exodus 22, first verse says, If a man steals an ox or a sheep and slaughters it or sells it, he shall restore five oxen for an ox and four sheep for a sheep. If the thief is found breaking and he is struck so that he dies, there shall be no guilt for his bloodshed. If the sun has risen on him, there shall be guilt for his bloodshed. He should make full restitution. If he has nothing, then he shall be sold for his theft. If the theft is certainly found alive in his hand, uh, whether it is an ox, donkey, or sheep, he shall restore double. So what you have here is a lot going on there, but I, but I just want to talk about that as a general thing, right? The idea is totally victim-based, right? If I steal your car, I give you back four cars, right? I mean, they didn't have cars. They had That's oxen, a good investment by my part. Right. So if I steal your car, I'm, I'm going to, to, to restore to you what you had lost, right? And not just what you had lost, because that wouldn't, there'd be no um, punishment in that. I'm actually going to have to restore to you more than what you've lost so that both you're compensated for what you went through. Right. And there is on my side, I'm having to deal with uh, what I've done wrong in such a way that I'm showing that there's, that there is uh, a remorse, but more importantly, what I'm doing is I am balancing the scales back, right? I am making, making this thing right. Mm -hmm. And, and so to balance the scales, wouldn't be to just give you what you have because then you've still had a crime committed against you right. to balance the scales. Biblically here, I have to do something more than what I took so that you are compensated in such a way that you, at the end of the day, feel better. Right. Like you took my car for a week before you were caught and had to give it back to me. But if I've gone without a car for a week, sure, I have my car back, but I still took the loss of right. not having a car for a week. And and not just the, the I would say it's less about, part, part of it would be about that, like, like the, the monetary the hassle. But it's more, if you've ever been a victim of a crime, there's something more that happens there. Right. Because you've been violated. You've been violated, right? right? You, you, feel, you feel less safe. You feel, you know, it causes emotional issues, right? Mm -hmm. And so, and you can't fix emotional issues by giving you four cars. But, but I think that it does something. It, it says, okay, that by doing this, by, by showing that I have to do something more, it, it, it restores your value. Because someone's taking your value away as a person when they treat you this way. Mm -hmm. And so by doing this, they're saying, no, no, you were valuable. I really messed up and I'm doing this. Meanwhile, the other person has had to um, pay, right. pay for their crime. So, so again, now we're going to, why are we doing this? Are we doing this to rehabilitate? Well, I don't see any way in which giving you four oxen or five oxen or four sheep is rehabilitating you in the sense of an education. It doesn't say, and shall undergo uh, drug and alcohol rehabilitation and a, and a program of education. To blah, blah. It doesn't say that. Right. It says, I give you these things, which suggests that what has happened is more about paying for, balancing back the way that things are, right? Um, and, and by doing that, I have, what I've done is I've restored to you. And then what happens is my place in society, because at this moment, I'm a criminal. I've stolen from you, I've whatever. There's a mark on that, right? This person's a thief, this person's whatever. When I restore to you, what happens is I come back into community mm. with the uh, with the, with the rest of the community, with the camp, with the with the tribe, with the people, with however you want to well, look at it, right? about Exodus, yeah, with the, society, the camp, <laughs> right? Yeah, the camp. You're the society that exists. Of course, you're talking about a very large camp, right? You know, a million yeah. people, a couple million people. So you're coming back into with your city, with your with your community. You're coming back into relationship with them. Now, what's what do you notice is not here as a as a punishment that we use as a punishment? Prison time. Yeah. 
they, we didn't, there were no cages. Mm-hmm. There's no cages in Jerusalem. Right. You know, very, there's, very there, difficult to take those along with you as you're traveling around. It is. <laughs> well, it, it wouldn't be hard to um, find a way to chain or to, or to oh, somehow, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, keep people out of society. Right. right. But you don't see in any, I said in Jerusalem, certainly there are cages in Jerusalem now. Um, in, in ancient Israel, you don't see any punishments that are, that are dealt with by isolating or putting people in cages or locking them up or doing things like that. In every case, what you see, you have some that are death penalty, to be fair. Right. Uh, there's a certain, there are certain things that went once they're done in that society. And of course this is pre-Christ and there's so much theology about, about this, that I can't go through all of that. I want to focus on the fact that what was there was for your average normal crimes stealing that type of thing mm-hmm. there was a process by which the by, by which the offender and the victim could be made right with each other mm-hmm. and that the offender and society could be made right with each other yeah now what you have you don't see anything here about and it shall be put on on this person's record and when they go to get a job everyone will be able to see forever that right. they stole a sheep mm-hmm. right that's what we have now we now have cages and records and so for the person who commits a crime, um, let's say, and, and look, as a, as a criminal defense attorney, as an attorney in general, I had people come in and they said, look, when I was 18, 19, 20, 21 years old, I did X. I stole something. And I, whatever it was, right? I was convicted of this crime. Mm-hmm. I'm now 42. I've been a Christ follower now for 15 years. Um, I'm a deacon at my church. I'm, I'm, you know, I have three children. They're all doing awesome. I love the Lord. I'm, I'm, I'm living my life the way I should and whatever. But when I try to get a job so I can take care of my family, this conviction from when I was 19 years old or 20 or 21 years old comes up and I can't get a job to support my family well. Right. And I'm thinking to myself, what more does this person need to do to make himself right with society? So that society is no longer looking at his past in such a way that they're afraid of him or that by corporate decree, you know, we can't hire anybody who has a felony on the record or can't hire anybody who has a misdemeanor on the record, whatever it Mm -hmm. is, 20 years later, right? And so there are some states um, that have created uh, systems whereby you can expunge certain things off your record. Um, In in Tennessee, where where I did my criminal practice, uh, and I did a lot more than just criminal law, but that was part of my practice. Uh, we eventually had a law that I think in 2012, they passed a law that allowed a lot more things to be eventually expunged. Still some you could not, um, but there were a lot more things that you could get expunged. X number of years of whatever, and you pay a fine, you do that. Because I think they recognize this, right? You are, you are uh, handicapping somebody's future economically and, and so on by branding them a criminal and not letting them restore themselves mm-hmm. to society. Um, as someone who's thinking about that, yourself, who's kind of hearing this, what are your thoughts um, about, about that part of it? What, what are the pros and cons that you see in, in giving somebody a record? Um, well, it, like in the situation you just described, it seems like it has gone and now um, they've become the victim you know they, they've they've paid their uh, their reconciliation dues, I guess. Um, their debt to society, right? Right, and now, but the the punishment is ongoing, um, and at that point, now it's they are a victim of the state. It seems like, mm-hmm. um, but it, and I see why this might have started though, because you get um, criminals who maybe it's like every five years they. Um, they burglarize someone or something like that. Mm-hmm. And so you want to be able to hang on to that record as proof that this person is not, uh, I mean, really, I would say that they haven't reconciled themselves. They have uh, tried to get out of their guilt, I guess. They, they've, um, what's the word I'm looking for? They've tried to get out of whatever punishment they were in, mm-hmm. but they have not, um, repented of of their crimes, and so they're going to do it again. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I guess I see why the state also wants to keep track of it in that way. Right. So there is definitely another side to this. I gave, obviously, the most sympathetic 
possible side. Mm -hmm. So-and-so steals a candy bar at 19 years old and at 40 years old, he's a perfect person and we're doing whatever. There's another side, Mm -hmm. which is so-and-so has committed 15 crimes over a 20 year period. And everything suggests that so-and-so is going to continue to commit crimes. Right. In which case, shouldn't punishment, retributive justice, shouldn't it require more from this person each time that they commit another crime, et cetera? Um, Or- the sex offender, mm-hmm. right? Um, a person who has a proclivity towards uh, a sex offense, and and therefore there's real question about uh, about the safety of other people in society, and shouldn't you know the sex offender registry, these kinds of things, shouldn't this person have to deal with that, and so on? So it's not as easy a question because everyone would say, I think most people would say, yeah, the person stole something when they were 19. Come on, right. give them a break, right? right? But a lot of people would say the opposite if it was a person who stole 50 cars, you know, uh, one a year for the last 50 years and like, okay, this person, there's a problem there. So the question is, what do you do, right? What do you do about that? I don't think it's an, if it was easy to answer, we wouldn't have law review articles and, and public discussions and so on about these issues like we do. I think it's hard to answer, but the question is then is the, is the punishment Take this guy who's stealing sheep, sheep stealer guy, or oxen. That's five, five to one for oxen. I had a buddy, yeah. Yeah, so yeah, you had, you, had, you had an oxen stealing buddy. Yeah, yeah. gosh. So let's say I'm stealing oxen. I steal an ox from you, and I got to go pay five oxes back. Now, that's not as small. If I'm stealing an ox, it means I don't have one, right? right Assumedly. Right. So I'm I'm not in a, in a financial position to be in a very good position. So for me to pay you back five oxen is going to take me some time. It's going to take effort. It's going to be really, really hard. How many times am I going to do that when each time I do it, I have to essentially, I mean, I'm in a very, very bad situation economically. I, I think the idea was that the, ret- the retributive part of the justice, me having to pay back five for one, is itself uh, at some level rehabilitative, right? Right. Um, it, it, the punishment is, and it may sound like, well, what's the big deal? Five oxes, you know, there's oxen everywhere, I guess. I don't know. Um, in, in Honduras, we see oxen. They, yeah. they do all kinds of, like, pull the trash uh, bins. It's so crazy, the, the, the mm-hmm. way they use oxen there. But um, to go get five oxen that you have to restore to somebody is a relatively serious uh, punishment. Mm-hmm. Um, you have to recognize it as a serious. So it's so like when I said cars, if you had to pay back five cars, like, you know, you're driving a uh, RAV4, right? So CRV. Uh, okay, CRV. <laughs> you're driving a CRV. I'm sorry. Um, Just want to be clear. Yeah. Okay. Hunter's driving a CRV. Hunter's CRV, I steal a CRV, I sell it, I get whatever. Let's just say, I'm just going to use a round number to say I get $5,000 for, for selling your CRV. Oh, you got a pretty good price. Okay. I get a good price for it. I get five grand. I sell your CRV, off it goes. I get caught. I've got to now replace five CRVs. <laughs> How easy is that going to be for anyone, let alone someone who had to steal a CRV to get some money? Um, it's a pretty serious thing. So the question is, okay... At what level does the retribution part need to match what's happened better so that recidivism is a less likely, you know, uh, outcome? So define recidivism for me, doing it again, committing, committing crimes in the future. Um, so if I'm and this, and this becomes complicated too, because to what extent is nurse mercy necessary to what extent, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Right. Um, your your decision to commit a crime has to run through your matrix, your decision making matrix, like any other decision. And so, certain um, retributive punishments, while their main goal, I think, is retributive. I think that the main reason that you have to play back the five ox oxen is retributive. It's a punishment that I am taking to restore myself. The retribution is paid to restore myself to society and to you. But it has other um, implications, one of which is I think it would have a uh, rehabilitative um, thing because in order to get those five oxen back, I'm going to have to change some things about my life. Right. To be able to, to be able to pay you back and whatever. I'm going to have to do something, right? I'm going to have to go borrow five oxen and then pay it off by working for that, per- whatever it happens to be, right? I'm going to have to do that. So there's a rehabilitative. Thing. And then there's also... Um, a, a, uh, what's the word I'm looking for here? Um, um, making other people not want to do it. My goodness. I'm an attorney. I can't believe I can't think. Of oh, this. uh, deterrent. Deterrent. Right. 
See, I'm dumb. Um, <laughs> a deterrent effect also, because when you, when other people see that you had to pay out five oxen back and what that took or five RAV fours or whatever back. I don't know what I'm going to do with those. What are you going to do with, I don't know. You just sell them, right? <laughs> um, when I, when somebody sees, oh my gosh, when that person stole that, they had to pay back five RAV fours, whatever. It also is going to be a deterrent. So while the main goal I think is retributive, I think, I think biblically the main goal is retributive and there's reasons for that, right? Um, and I'm going to, I'm going to jump into that in just a second, but while the main goal is that there are side um, there are ancillary or side goals that of deterrence and rehabilitation that I think happen naturally when the system is designed right. Now, the reason that I say it's retributive is because we go to Christ, right? And this is where, you know, if you're going to think about the criminal justice system and, and whatever, you've got to think about sin. You've got to think about um, our, our violation against God, which is ultimately what our sin is. Even in sin, it is not the person who we've sinned against, it's God. So it's both, really, right? But David commits adultery with Bathsheba. Then he kills Uriah, essentially, um, orders his death, essentially. And when he, in Psalm 51, is talking to the Lord about it, he says, against you only have I sinned. Now, how is that possible? How did he not sin against Uriah and Bathsheba? Certainly he did, right? Um, and yet the, the, he recognizes that his sin was a violation of what God had called him to do before it was a violation. It was love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Before the loving your neighbor as yourself was violated, the loving the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength was violated. Right. So David recognizes that his sin is against primarily against God. Why that's important is because when we look at Christ and what he suffered on the cross— what we see is a retributive punishment that has been substituted for the retributive punishment that we owe. There's a what we, what we call penal substitutionary atonement, um, that Christ has atoned for our sin, right? That what there's nothing rehabilitative about death. It's it's ultimate, right? So when we're talking about the death penalty, which we will do in a second, um, it, it's certainly no one's saying the death penalty is rehabilitative. Yeah, no, that would be a. Uh, it would seem to wrong. go against the whole pr- point of rehabilitation, right? Right. There's nothing. It may be you could say that the death penalty has a deterrent effect, and certainly lots of people argue that. Yeah. But it's not rehabilitative. Uh, there's right. real questions about whether it's really a deterrent um, for most people, uh, or for or to for people who re- want to murder. To say it's re- rehabilitative would be to say there's no hope for this person, I guess. Well, well, then who's it rehabilitating? I'd be you. Re- Normally, when we talk about rehabilitation. We're talking about for the prisoner, for the for the person who's accused of the crime or who's. Well, I think what it's saying is you are rehabil. You're you're curing them of their need to commit that crime okay. in a pretty dark way. <laughs> I guess that I guess you could look at it that way. I don't I don't think that there's much. It's a stretch uh, when you're talking about rehabilitation. I don't think it's there. But but let's let's stay on track with penal substitution and atonement. <laughs> So when Christ dies for us, he truly is paying a penalty, a retributive justice penalty for sin, right? Which is why when I come back to, when I talk about the criminal justice system in general, I think the only just way to have to have a criminal justice system is that punishment for sin is that. It's punishment. He took on punishment. Christ took on punishment for us, right? He was punished for us. He paid the price for us. There was a retributive price to be paid, right? It wasn't, it, it ultimately criminal justice system is not about rehabilitation. That may be a goal. And of course it should be. We always want to see restoration, redemption, those types of things happen. We want to see people rehabilitated or transformed, but the, but the penalty is not about primarily about transformation. The penalty is about having to make the scales right. Right. which we could never do because mm-hmm. our sin against God is one that could only be the, the only proper response to our sin against God, because we have made ourselves dirty, filthy, you know, so on. And so he, as perfection, God could not have a dirty, filthy person who has committed uh, crimes against God, sins, right? Who has missed the mark, who has committed sin against God. That person couldn't be in community with him. And so something has to happen to, to restore relationship, which mm-hmm. is why I'm talking about back here, we see you pay a certain price, you can restore relationship. This is an imperfect, um, as, as God would look at it, the law for Israel which was to show 
that we can't do that. And Paul talks about this a lot. And of course, there's a lot of theology that goes on with all this. I'm just trying to help people make some connections to the criminal justice system and why we do what we do and so on. Christ had to atone for our sin through his death. It was a retributive punishment that he took on that was ours. Now, there are people who have other theories, theological theories, about what the what Christ's crucifixion and his death did for us. But the only one that makes any sense to me is this one, is that Christ substituted himself, took on our punishment, our retrib- he took on retributive justice for us. Not rehabilitative, not deterrent. There's no point in deterring people who are already lost. They're already lost. It was retributive, right? And so and so when I go back and then look at the law and look at the way God has done things, I say that crimes against God and against people or against the state or however you want to look at it, really God and people, because what are the state, what's the state other than other people, mm-hmm. right? That those cannot be cured by a purely rehabilitative or a purely deterrent effect, because deterrent effects are by their nature for people other than the person being punished. They're to deter, deterrent. Is, or for the person being punished in the future. Possibly. Right. But then they're, like I say, the death penalty couldn't do that. Right. And, and that's, that's right, part right. of the criminal justice system. Mm-hmm. So there are, so generally speaking, when we talk about deterrence, we're talking about deterring others in society from committing the crime. It would be unjust for me to use you as a way to deter other people unless you, in fact, what? Unless I, in fact... Deserved it. Okay. Right? You would have to deserve it. Because if I took something and gave you something you didn't deserve just to just to scare other people, which is what deterrence is, then I have done something unjust against you. Okay. Okay. If, if my punishment against you is only for the effect of deterring other people, but you don't actually deserve what I've done. Okay. So that's a problem. So deterrence by itself cannot be um, a just way of, of doing a criminal justice system. And if I just try to rehabilitate you, I haven't done anything to to pay for the thing that you've done. I have not. I have not helped your victim. Mm-hmm. I have not made you right with God. I have helped you to be better later on, but we've done nothing to bring you into into balance with society. Into rela- balance is a is a bad word because that can get spiritually weird. I haven't done anything to to restore relationship with reconcile. society. Yeah, to reconcile you to society. Christ reconciled us to God through his death because he paid a price for it, right? Right. It is fundamentally important for us to understand that. And as believers, if we want to have the mind of Christ, we got to understand how God sees sin and therefore how God would see crime. And we have to understand that. So, so then when we're looking at it, we go, okay, when you commit a crime, X, Y, Z should happen primarily for, to, as a retributive punishment for the crime to bring you back into a place with society of relationship. That's that's the way the state looks at it. For us, we look at it, okay, with God, how do we do that? Now there's this whole other piece, and that's grace. Mm-hmm. Some people would say that the state should not and cannot uh, exercise or show grace. That that's not the place of the state. The, the state is to bear the sword. The state could never show grace. So if you've committed a crime, um, that the state doesn't have any ability to do anything except give you whatever the penalty is for that crime. Um, I would disagree with that. Uh, we have things that we've, we've had that built into the criminal law system forever. Things like pardoning. A governor of a state or the president of the United States on federal crimes has the ability to pardon people uh, for crimes that they've committed, that they've been convicted for, and that they have a a sentence to serve. You could have a 10-year sentence, and if it was a federal crime, the president could say, I'm pardoning you. I'm, I'm, I'm letting you go. The, the idea that the state can and even should, or else the, 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 the power wouldn't exist unless we thought that the power was just in some circumstances, can and even should sometimes exercise mercy because for any number of reasons. That the person has, has, in fact, we can see that there has been the retributive thing that's happened and they don't need the rest of the sentence, or there has been some level of, re- uh, of, of rehabilitation or whatever, that there's a place for the state to exercise mercy, to exercise grace. And I think it's important because, we, because God has exercised unbelievable and, and, and uh, 
infinite grace towards us and what he's done for us. And if we're to be like him, there is a level to which we have to show grace for one another. Forgive or what? What happens if you don't forgive between you and God? It won't be forgiven. That's a pretty big deal, right? right? There's no suggestion that it matters what the person has done to you, how serious it is, whether you feel like forgiving, uh, whether it's easy to do, whatever your job is to forgive because of the grace that's been shown to you. Now, I do not believe that the state is under the same obligation to forgive. So just so I'm clear, Mm -hmm. I don't think that the state, in order to be Christ-like, should forgive and forbear every crime, or we would be in big trouble, right? right? Well, and is is there room to forgive a crime without releasing that person from the retribution the the punishment of that crime i don't i don't know that for the state that a that the state has any other way of showing grace other than to um take take back some level of the earned retribution okay okay i think that's the only way the state could ever show grace i think that the state needs to have the ability to to uh show grace in some circumstances, even where technically the person more retribution could have been asked, but enough has been given. Um, that, that there's a, that there's a reason why enough has been given. One of the problems with it is when we give the state the power to forgive or the power to show grace, sometimes like all things with people, it's done in an ungodly way. Right. And the guilty goes free. See, God doesn't want the innocent to be punished or the guilty to go free um, in, in, in that kind of a situation. And so pardoning can be kind of funky. I think that it's, a, it's appropriate in certain circumstances for the state to show grace when it's in, in the kind of uh, situations where it seems clear to all of us that the, that the state should. Uh, but in those situations, doesn't that mean that it wouldn't be, it's not grace, but it's justice at that point? Because you were saying... Um, like for instance, oh, they've they've shown rehabilitation Absolutely. or retribution. Mm-hmm. That in you, I think you even said the word enough. So in that situation, the state isn't really showing mercy. The state is just trying to correct what is just or or adjust its adjust what it's already decreed would be justice to be less uh, extreme. Certainly, one of the reasons for pardon power would be to correct an injustice that has occurred by by the natural working of the criminal justice system. So you got convicted and the law had said 10 years for the thing you did. And we as a society come to realize that the retribution required in 10 years is actually, it actually outweighs the crime that you've committed. And so a pardon in that case isn't grace, it's justice. Right. It's, it's fixing the system so that you only pay what you're supposed to pay. Mm-hmm. Then there is the, the ability to pardon in circumstances where maybe you didn't fully, you didn't fully uh, do your retribution. Um, but there are other reasons why the state might want to grant you grace. Um, and, and yeah, it's difficult. You know, right. it's difficult. It's so, weird. yeah, I think that's a good, I think that's a good point. Is it really grace? Maybe not. Maybe not. Um, and that's why I wonder if, if the, it makes me wonder, does the state really have a place to give grace? Because for the state to give grace, a lot of times is to put its, uh, its citizens in danger. It could be. I could think, be. I think that, that if they made that decision, that's an unjust decision under any set of circumstances, right? Right, right, right. And that's but, what, that's but then what, again, we're talking about cages again. And, and right, right, right. Yeah. the question about whether that's how we should be doing criminal justice in the first place is, I think, a very fair question. Mm-hmm. For instance, there are a lot of crimes and there are people, believe it or not, there are people other than Americans in Western society in the world. And there are actually places where instead of when you stole the car, instead of uh, putting you in a cage, we would take you into the town square and give you 10 lashings with a cane. On Singapore, your back. right? Singapore. I don't know if they still do it, but they certainly were doing it as of 20 years ago because it was a really big I deal think. with an American kid that was over there and yeah, got yeah. caned. Um, but they would say, look, you're coming out, you're publicly humiliated, mm-hmm. you're, you're beaten, you know, physically, but when you're done, you're done. Yeah. Um, you know, and I don't know if Singapore does that, but that would be that would be the nature to me of corporal punishment. Are there crimes where corporal punishment, a public uh, sort of a public shaming for the act and a a price that you pay in your own body 
right. is the way to restore you. And then when you're done, it's kind of like two two guys getting in a fist fight, and when they're done, they hug it out, right? right? <laughs> like when it's done, it's done. Right. You know, it, there's a finality to it. Um, is that a better way than having cages? A lot of people are going to be like, I can't believe that he's, suge- I'm not suggesting that we do that. Right. I'm saying it is one of the theories of justice that exists out there um, that has been used. How effective it is. I haven't been to Singapore. I've heard it's, <laughs> I've heard it's pretty nice. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. now that may not be, it's, if it's wrong to do, to, to use corporate punishment in that way, then it doesn't matter whether they've been able to create a nice society through it because if it's right. unjust, it's unjust. Right. Um, that's like the ends justifying. The right. Means. Yeah. That's obviously if it's unjust, Fallacy. if it's an unjust means, then it doesn't matter whether the ends end up being good. Um, I'm just saying there are alternatives to cages. Um, and, and we've tried to use some of them, you know, w- rehab programs and so on and so forth. But then again, we muddle the point, the, the mission of the criminal justice system going back to, can the state execute grace? I think you've brought up a good point. It's probably not really grace that we're talking about. We're probably talking about retribution that's happened in other ways. So you, you know, a person gets, gets, uh, uh, um, pardoned. Because they have, let's say, provided some other service to the state. You know, they, they've, they've done something, they've, they've accomplished something, they've done something that suggests that, that the remainder of their time in prison or whatever is not necessary because they've somehow other made up for it. I think those are circumstances that would not be grace, that they would be justice. Um, and so, yeah, maybe, maybe the state shouldn't be in the grace business. I'll tell you where I see it the most though. It's not in pardoning where I see it the most is in prosecutorial discretion Mm -hmm. where I see, where I see stuff where let's say I've got a client and it's a young person, young woman or young man. And there's there, you know, they've clearly committed the crime. Mm -hmm. No question about it. And yet there's enough extenuating circumstances around that person's life. um, And enough remorse that's been shown that what a prosecutor is doing again, I'm not really sure I'd call it grace. I would let's let's just say there's someone who can. I've certainly had clients in both these camps. There could be someone who's been who's committed a crime. They've clearly committed the crime. Maybe they've confessed to the crime. And one client is like, I don't care. Mm. You know, they don't they don't care. They don't feel bad about it. They're like, let's see what's going to happen. Let's right. roll the dice, whatever. And then another client who committed the same exact crime, but is just destroyed mm-hmm. by, you know, they're just, they, they're, they're embarrassed. They're ashamed. They're never going to do it again. They're they're they, They've clearly suffered, right? They, they have clearly paid some price in their own emotions and all the rest of that already because they got arrested and they went to jail for a night and they, you know, and their parents found out and that, you know, <laughs> and, and that person is more likely to have a prosecutor say, this is a person who has already suffered at some level, um, and I'm going to treat them differently than the person who has clearly not suffered at all and doesn't care about what they did, and a prosecutor might make a discretion. I'm not sure that that's grace rather than justice, as you brought up. Well, I think in a way, because um, part of, and I'm looking at it through, through a, the, the lens of Christ, part of us receiving grace is showing um, is repenting, which is penitence. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is is um, expressing our our sorrow um, and asking for forgiveness, and that's what that person is doing in that situation. So it does look more like grace. I, we have to be careful with that because the whole point of grace is that it's undeserved. Right. So the idea that the person who expresses sorrow is more deserving of grace than the person who doesn't is probably not the way to look at it. Rather, the person who expresses sorrow is asking for grace. Yes. And so it, the person who's actually asking for grace is the person. And the only reason you'd ask for grace is if you believed you did something wrong. And that's why I'm saying it's grace, not not justice. Right. It, it's, not, it's not what that person deserves, but it's what they asked for and the person who holds who, who the the, uh, the offended the one who is um prosecuting has the option to um accept that forgiveness and give grace mm-hmm. so i guess i don't know if i'd call it grace i still think again i think you're still talking about they've already justice suffered justice in a different way i, I think mm-hmm. i think that i mean I actually would have used the word grace to describe it just because I haven't done a lot of thinking. I remember in law school, there was a guy who's like, the government can't give grace. The government doesn't have the right to give grace. And I always thought, that seems silly. 
But now that you mention it, really what we're talking about isn't grace. Now, I think this person would have said the government shouldn't pardon anybody or do anything. Um, I think the government should, but I really do think it's it's a way of, as as we've sort of discussed, is bringing, solving inequities. Bringing back into balance right. that justice if I've got a If I've got a guy who grew up with, it's like anything, right? How serious was the thing that was done and what is the proper punishment for it? If, if you know better and you know, you have, you've had every opportunity to do what's right and whatever, and then you do something wrong, is it worse for you than the person who grew up under these circumstances and those and, and should prosecutors and judges and so on be the ones making those determinations? My, my thought is yes, just make sure you have good prosecutors and judges and so on. Other people are saying, I don't trust prosecutors. I don't just, I don't trust judges. I don't want And, and in a, in a republic like the one that we have, you have the ability to deal with that because most prosecutors, most DAs are elected. Right. In, in a lot of states, including ours, judges are elected. Mm-hmm. And so when you are talking about, well, I well, I would want better judges, well, that's your job as a citizen to get better judges, to get people with the most discretion for those cases. I still, though, don't know that I would call it grace. Um, I think that grace can only be granted by the truly offended which mm-hmm. is the person who you've victimized, or by God. When a crime is committed directly against the state. What's an example of that? Oh, let's say you stole money from the state. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Easy enough. Right. Um, then I think that the representatives of that state, if they pardoned you, I guess would be showing grace in that okay, situation. Right. So, so maybe you have that. All crimes in the state's mind are committed against the state. So they would see themselves as as in the position to grant grace. The problem with it is, is that you, you start to get issue when you show mercy or grace to one and not another, you start to get issues that come up as to, is it fair handed? Is it even handed? And the law has to be even handed or it's no longer the law. And and by the nature of the name, the justice system, how, why can they, it's not called the mercy system, right? Yeah. Exactly. Justice is supposed to be blind. That's why you got the the blind statue holding the scales. Uh, you know, the, the idea is that justice right. has to be promulgated to everybody so we all know what the law is and that it's and that it's even handedly laid out. I'm, seems, I'm telling you what happens, not necessarily what should happen. Right, right. It seems like the only way the justice system could actually show mercy is like a lottery system. It seems like. Which seems like a terrible idea. <laughs> right. Like, like we randomly let people out based yeah, on what. Yeah. Like that seems like the only way. Like that, when Barabbas was let out, like we, I always release somebody to you, you know, during the, during Passover. Right. Um, and they're like, give us Barabbas. It, kind of almost like that. Like there's a lottery system. Like we're just going to let somebody go just right. to be nice. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, terrible idea. Um, uh, yeah. But, so. <laughs> but the question really becomes for those who are the, the law and order folks, right? I don't mean this show. I mean, law and order. I want that, you know, everybody should get the same. Pre- you know, here's the, here's the thing that gets you. Philosophically and even theologically, I think that the person, the person who is, is, has committed a crime needs to go through the retributive part of that justice. We, even things like having a, we have a complicated sentencing system right? Mm-hmm. Depends on the state. There's a federal sentencing system that's different, um, but there's a complicated uh, system for for sentencing within within each state. Um, and, and there's all these factors and there's all this stuff. We don't treat people equally. If you've never committed a crime before, you get a lower sentence than if you've committed a crime before. If you're, you know, it, it, there there are certain things that, that, that play into sentencing. And we put a lot of discretion in the hands of judges and prosecutors and what prosecutors are asking for and what judges grant as far as sentencing. Um, And I think that that really rubs people the wrong way because sometimes we see these sentences that do not seem like they're retributive. They don't seem like they fit the crime and the people get very upset, especially if you or someone you love was convicted for the same crime and got something much harsher. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, there are some real inequities there, but as someone who's been on the front line of it, who has had clients and I can see the clients I've had, like I said, I've had clients who did not care and, and what it just says, you know, they, they were definitely, their mindset was not, I want to get better. I want to be kind. I've made a mistake. It was, I'm going to get what I want. You know, the, the people that people are scared of. Right. Mm-hmm. And then I've had clients who clearly, had paid a price in their own emotions and whatever, and we're not going to do something again and and so on. And how d- is the state a proper 
um, entity to decide between those. Mm -hmm. You know, that's, I'm not trying to answer that question today. I have an opinion. I'm just describing, this is descriptive, not prescriptive right now. Right. I'm telling you what happens. The truth is right now, the, the state has a decent amount of discretion in those things, except for in certain sentencing, and, and that would be mandatory minimum sentencing laws. Um, and the federal government has had mandatory minimum sentencing for a long time, and it has been a subject of massive amounts of ink that have been spilled over whether it's just or unjust, mostly because it seems to... Um, in certain mandatory minimum sentences, some of which I think have been fixed now, uh, but it seems to um, to benefit uh, those who commit certain kinds of crimes who tend to be wealthy and white, uh. as opposed to people who make certain kinds of crimes who tend to be um, not wealthy and minority. Mm -hmm. And so you'll see a crime that's likely to be committed in this neighborhood has a mandatory minimum sentence of X, and the crime that's committed in this neighborhood has a mandatory of minimum sentence of X minus, right, so something right. much less. And so the way that that's been, you know, played out has has really had a problem. But mostly outside, and that's a whole podcast we could talk about. I could talk about. I wrote a paper on that in law school. And you and Dr. David spoke a little bit about this when you guys did that podcast from Hawaii. Is that right? We may have. I don't remember. That's actually like one of the podcasts like I listen more, to. I've slept since it. then, man. Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah, we may have. Um, it's an issue. The The fact is, is that in most cases in the criminal justice system, there's actually a relatively large amount of discretion that exists between prosecute police officers and then prosecutors and then judges. Like at every step, there's there are opportunities for things to be adjusted so that people, people, not not a computer mm -hmm. tries to make sure that whatever crime has been committed sort of fits right. the thing. And so there's all these checks and balances as you go up, but there are opportunities at every stage for people to be treated disparately, as we would say a lot differently. Right. Okay. So that you and I both committed one crime and, and maybe you have an officer that says, you know, a hunter go home and don't do it again. And he takes the, takes your drugs, throws them in the garbage can and says, you know, it's possession of drugs. Yeah, for you. Didn't just throw them in the garbage can. I well, hope flushes them down the toilet. I don't know what people do. <laughs> I think they have like a burn center. Okay, they burn the drugs. I, whatever. I watch cops, um, man. <laughs> okay, all right. Well, that's because you're from Spokane. Right. They have lots of cops. Well, I might get on the TV. I might be on TV if yeah, I watch cops. That'd be sweet. Hopefully, hopefully you will be. Right. Um, so well, I don't live there now. That's true. <laughs> um, so anyway. <laughs> Gosh. Sorry, I distract you. Your your drugs are burned in the thing, and they tell you to go home and don't do it again, right? For whatever reason, he thinks you've quote unquote learned your lesson. Mm -hmm. Okay, then I'm arrested, and and the officer for the same amount of drugs on the same street, and the officer says, "Turn around, put your hands in the car." She takes me in and charges me with the maximum criminal possession, and I go hit the. When I get to the prosecutor, the prosecutor says, "I want the maximum form," and the judge says, "I want." The and so you and I, you went home. And I end up in prison for two years. Mm -hmm. There, that is very different treatment. And because the each person along that process has had an opportunity to uh, use their discretion, people are going to end up with different treatments. Is that just? Is that fair? That's a question for you, the listener, to think through. But don't take an automatic stance on it one way or the other, like right. yes or no. It's actually very complicated. But it also um, shows us that you know, the, the system that we have and the way that it's built is not necessarily, um, the one that Christ would build. Right. Um, I think that, I think that there is, I think that there are a lot of theories that go around that are not based in scripture, not based in, um, Christianity, some of which would be more lenient, some of which would be more harsh, um, but all of which are based on trying to, whether they're either practical, right? Like I just want to keep everybody who would ever commit a crime in a cage forever right. so they can never hurt us again. Mm -hmm. um, and some of them are more um, people-based. Like I just want to see that people who have been put in a position, like they see crime as a disease, right? right? I just want to see people who have committed crimes because it's not really their fault, right? Um, and so what we really want is pure rehabilitation. We just want to take this person, we want to give them everything they need to be successful in. In both cases, I think the people on each end of that are wrong. Mm -hmm. There's no question that you that the person who commits a crime 99.9% .9 of the time, while there are factors that led to it, has made a choice. 
and that there's a proper retributive punishment in each case, whatever it may be, whether it's you feel really bad or you spend a year in jail. I don't, I don't know the answer that I'm not trying to answer the question right now, right. but there is a proper retributive punishment because it really is a choice and rehabilitation by itself is not, we are not curing a disease in the criminal justice system. We are, we are making people right with society. That's what the state is doing. As mm -hmm. believers, we have a whole different thing going on. Right. There should be a whole nother process after the justice system. There's a totally different process for believers. We are making people right with God through oh, yeah. the bloodshed yeah. by Jesus Christ and then bringing them back into society by showing grace as the body of Christ. Totally different thing. Right. The state is do it has a different goal, but it is not rehabilitation and it is not pure deterrence, neither one of which would be just on their own. Right, right. It is it is retributive or ought to be retributive, and it should be even handed at some level, although that's very complicated. Mm -hmm. uh, very <laughs> So complicated. I mean, if you go in and start doing the reading on this stuff, uh, it's very complicated. But I want to pull back to, as believers, once again, how should we look at it? Because there's there's crimes that you commit against the state and whatever. But every sin, especially every sin that offends a brother or sister in Christ, is a serious thing. Um, it's, it's a crime against our Lord. It's a crime against God. And one of the things that I think that we struggle with is forgiveness, grace. I think that that is one of the I think it's very hard for people. I think if it was easy for people, God wouldn't have to tell us so often that we have to do it. Um, it would just be something we did, right? Um, if it if it was if it was fun, it, you, He doesn't necessarily have to go through the Bible and tell us, "Look, make sure that you're having fun and that you're laughing a lot and whatever." Because we like to do those things. We don't need to be instructed as much because they they're fun. Right. Um, they come naturally. Saying that you have to forgive, that you have to love your enemies that you have to forgive people, um, that that you have to show grace, those kinds of things, those are very hard. And the way that they relate to the criminal justice system, we have a certain view about what criminal justice should do. Oftentimes, for, for a lot of people, it is not a very gracious view that we have. And maybe it's because you think that the state shouldn't have a, an, an arm that does grace. Okay, fine. We've, we've talked about that. You can think about that. Maybe we'll talk about that more another time. Maybe I'll share some of my, more of my actual thoughts on that. But then we've got the side that I care about as, as a pastor, which is what about, what are we doing with the people who have committed crimes against us that aren't necessarily illegal, but they hurt, right? So, mm -hmm. so the person who has betrayed you, the person who's lied to you, or the person, the, the, the spouse who has cheated on you, you know, um, the, the person who's abused you, the, you know, whatever it is. Um, and I'm not, by the way, just so we're really clear, I'm not talking about, um, when I talk about forgiveness and grace, I'm not talking about restoration of the same relationship. So if you beat me up every time I see you, I may have to forgive you, but I sure as heck am not going to see you anymore. Right. Right. So there's a big difference between, uh, you know, if, if a person is in a, an abusive relationship um, or a person is in, uh, there's a serial adulterer in a marriage, I'm not saying just keep on giving grace and let this person continue to cheat on you and, and give you every disease in the book. I'm not saying that. And I'm not, and I'm, and I'm not saying that anybody who's in, who's being abused and, and harmed should stay in that. So just be really clear. I'm not saying that I'm talking about what happens in your own heart between you and God about the way that you are holding on to the sins of other people. And I think that it is extremely difficult for most people to forgive and let things go. And yet we expect God to do that for us because he's promised to do so. And we, in fact, our only hope and our only joy is in the fact that God has done that for us. And so I guess as we sort of land the plane here on this particular pod podcast, I would say that, okay, criminal justice, that's all interesting and whatever. And, and maybe half that conversation was like, whatever. <laughs> Right. Um, I don't know. I don't know how interested people are in this. It's, it's so complicated. I realized once we started talking about, it, I'm not gonna be able to get to the bottom of any of it. It's just, you talk for hours, there's books written on this stuff, right? Right. But the way it comes back to us is our own criminal justice system that happens in our own heart and, and wanting to make people pay for things or wanting to hold a grudge or wanting to not forgive. Um, you know, I'd ask, I'd ask every listener to, 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 Talk to your own heart, if you will. Are there people who you are not giving grace to? Are there people who you're not letting God be the avenger for the thing, but rather you yourself are going to avenge? Um, are there people who, it's, it's a very different thing to say, I don't trust somebody anymore and I don't forgive somebody. Right. It's, I think it's totally okay when you've been offended to say there's not trust there anymore. And that the, that the only way that that's coming back is that the person 
builds trust back up with you through actions that would build trust. Like repentance. Like repentance and a change, right. like a true repentance, a turning right, around, right. a transformative repentance. That's fine. That does not absolve you from your duty to forgive and to have grace, right. which means that you're no longer holding it against the person, right? Mm-hmm. That you've given it to God to deal with, that you're no longer holding it against the person, that you yourself are no longer punishing that person or holding a grudge or whatever that is, that you've let that go. Mm-hmm. That is not the same thing as saying, because you've done that, you have to let them back into relationship or that you have to let them back into trust because those, they may be unwise to do that. Right. Um, you should have good counsel about whether you should put the, the person back in the situation of restoring relationship, but your duty to forgive does not have exceptions. There's no, unless you can come up with one, I'm not aware of any exception in scripture to the fact that we have to forgive our enemies, even people who have done horrible things to us. Yeah. No. And that's easy for you and I to sit here at a table in Camus and say, forgive people, but there are people who have had horrific things done to them. Mm -hmm. Um, Many people who, when they were children, had horrific things done to them. And it is not as easy as just, oh, God says forgive, so I'll just forgive, la, la, la. That's not, that's not how it works for most people. And I get that. Like, I am not, I'm not trying to speak from a place where I've experienced none of the pains that you have and telling you, you should just forgive. The truth is, is that most of us have experienced some of these things. But we have a high priest who can sympathize with Absolutely. With us in every way. Right? That's right. Isn't that what it says? That's what it says. <laughs> yeah, read Hebrews. Um, it, it, there, is a, there is a proactive, positive duty for you to stop carrying in your own heart anger and, and all the rest of that at those who you've been called to forgive. Um, at the end of the day, you harm yourself, and God knows that. He knows that it needs to be given to him. And forgiveness and grace has to come from you towards that person. Again, being clear, that doesn't mean you're back in relationship. That doesn't mean you're back in trust. It just means that you're no longer holding that person's sin in your own heart against them, that you've let that thing go. Um, You still have to be wise about future relationship with the person, future trust with the person, but you have to forgive. Um, And I think one of the things that may get confusing for some people is that they think that by forgiving that means that that you have to be back in relationship. The forgiving and forgetting doesn't mean forgetting the fact that this person has shown uh, character issues that that may make it unwise to be in a relationship. Forgiving and forgetting means I'm no longer holding it against you. And so I would just I just encourage you, if that's you, and you're being honest with yourself and you're saying I'm not I haven't forgiven. Mm-hmm. Not just I don't have trust again. Not just I, I don't want to be in relationship because those things may be the wise thing for you to do, but you really haven't forgiven. You're holding on to it. I would I would say, let the scripture speak to you. Let let the Holy Spirit speak to you. Christ has been clear. God has, has asked us and shown us. <laughs> Remember, he, we, we were still sinners when Christ died for us. That's how he showed his love for us. And you will have people in your life who are still sinning, um, who you will have to forgive mm-hmm. um, because that's what we're called to do. So um, I wonder, I, th- I think it's really easy to tell whether or not we trust somebody. I think you, you can tell whether or not you trust someone, but how would, you, how would you advise someone on whether or not they've forgiven someone? Cause they might not know. Um, they know that they should have forgiven them, but how do you know if you actually have forgiven someone? At what point can you say, I, I, I have fully forgiven this person who's wronged me. That's a good question. Uh, it's it's like some things. Um, there are certain things that you know when you see it. Okay. You, you know. Um, and I think forgiving can be a verb that is ongoing mm-hmm. um, as, opposed That's true. To, yeah. as opposed to something that happens in one moment and then never has to happen again. Right. In other words, I think you have to actively forgive. Right. Um, But I think that there's a lightness that comes as you've let it go. If you're if you're still carrying, yeah, a peace, exactly, a peace. Mm -hmm. If you're still carrying the heaviness of of your of your anger and all of the all of the things that would come with your vengeance, you haven't forgiven. Right. 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 Um, If 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 you've gone from hating or from despising or from wanting vengeance to to a place of compassion mm-hmm. for that person, you've probably forgiven them. Right. So if you've gone from, I want to see you suffer to I'm so broken over the fact that you're so broken that you would do something like this. Right. Mm-hmm. That's, that's the, that's where you've crossed the threshold into forgiveness. Right. You're, you're now saying, 
I may not, I may not let you near me again because right, right. you've got this issue or that issue. I, and I don't, and I can't trust you and it'd be unwise for me to be in a relationship with you. But I'm actually sad about that fact mm-hmm. rather than reveling in it. Right. You know? Right. Um, and I, yeah, it's just one of those things where you know it when you see it. Like, like, you know, people, mm-hmm. people will ask sometimes like, you know, how far can I go uh, with my girlfriend or, or how many drinks can I have before it's drunkenness? And, and the answer is pretty simple. You know. Right. Yeah. You know, like your conscience will like, you should know what is, it, it is not rocket science. Like, you know, now the a different question is how do I do it? Right. Mm-hmm. As opposed to, you know, how do I know when I've done it? The, 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 the other question would be, how do I forgive? Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that while I would love to get into that right now, um, I think that's probably a whole podcast. Right, yeah. Um, what does it look like? What are the what are the practices of forgiveness? What do they look like? How do I get myself there when I feel like I'm not capable of it? Because here's the thing. I actually don't think that we are in our own strength in this fallen world capable of forgiving. I that's think it's something point. that has to come from the power of the Holy Spirit Yeah. to truly forgive. Um, I think that we can show... We can show uh, signs of forgiveness. We can even decide that we're not going to say anything about it. We can. There's a lot of things that we can do that look like forgiveness, but I think the kind of forgiveness that brings peace only comes from the Holy Spirit. Mm-hmm. And so I think that 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 may be something we walk through in a future podcast. Um, and and I encourage you if you're listening to this, you go to Acts Church to to talk to one of the elders, the deacons, or or uh, your life group leader, or me, or, or Hunter, or somebody, and and counsel through that issue if you're trying to forgive and you want to forgive, but you're having a difficulty doing it. Um, but I think for the for the larger audience, uh, this is something we'll probably talk about again. What does it look like for me to do it? Um, as opposed to your question, which I also think is important, how do I know when it's been done? Mm-hmm. Um, because in some cases, we've been harmed so bad that that it does pass understanding that we could have peace over it. So in Romans 1, starting to verse 28, it says this, And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting, being filled with all unrighteousness. And then there's this list, which I find very interesting. Sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness, they are whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, and then these last two, unforgiving, unmerciful, who knowing the righteous judgment of God that those who practice such things are deserving of death, not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. When I see lack of forgiveness in a list with things like murder <laughs> and sexual immorality. Yeah. Um, and, and it's very clear. It says that those who do those things are deserving of death. Um, I take it, start to take it pretty seriously. Right. Um, and, and I know that for some people it's like, how could, how could me not forgiving this person who victimized me or who hurt me or who's offended me or who whatever, um, how could that be the same? It's, it's, it's not the same, but it's, but it also is a sin. Right. Um, it's different, but it's sinful. And it shows that you're not giving proper uh, honor to what God has done for you. Um, and, and the fact is, is that I have a lot more, uh, I guess, understanding for people who truly, I mean, obviously in, in my roles in life, I've run into people who have been truly, truly harmed in some very, 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 very serious ways. Um, but oftentimes the person doesn't want to forgive has just been offended, just had their pride offended. Uh, you know, somebody has hurt their feelings essentially, and they're holding these grudges and they're, and they're, and they, they're hating people or they're despising people or they're talking about people or, you know, they're, they're doing that kind of thing. And it's like the thing that was actually done in the beginning wasn't really anything more than an offense to the person's pride. You know, they would mm-hmm. say their dignity. Um, but the truth is, it's probably an offense to their pride. Often those are people who don't want to forgive. And all I would do is I'd say, look, it's all of us. We, we've all been there. We've all had to struggle with what forgiveness looks like. And if you are, if you have those who you have not forgiven, God's calling you to forgive. Um, and so that's what I want to leave you with. Uh, yeah, criminal justice, interesting stuff and whatever. But ultimately, uh, what God's asked us to do, what we're responsible for, is to let him be the avenger. And to forgive those who have harmed us. Uh, and so, you know, keep that in mind. We're going to, we'll be back with you next time, but let's go ahead and end this with prayer. Father, we just, uh, we ask that 
well, we live in a broken world and therefore we have a broken criminal justice system. Um, it is not it is not perfect on one side or on the other. Uh, I think there are many good people in that system who um, try to do what's right and try to seek justice and try to seek fairness and try to seek um, doing what's right and try to honor you. In fact, there, believe it or not, I know you believe it, Lord, but there are many people who love you who are in the criminal justice system. We pray for them and we pray for the people who go through it and we pray for the change of hearts of those who have um, committed crimes who have harmed other people, that you would transform them, that they would come to know you, that they would that they would seek forgiveness from you, that as they're in that place where they've hit rock bottom, where they're they're going to prison, uh, or, or or whatever it may be, that in that moment that they would seek you, um, knowing that they've got nothing left in themselves, and that you would come and you would heal them and you would forgive them, and that brothers and sisters in Christ would visit them in prison, would love them, would care about them, and we have many ministries that go to prisons that care about the people who who are um, paying for crimes or, or or however we want to put it, but but we also we ask for ourselves for our own hearts in forgiving others. That we are not judge, jury, and executioner to other people because of what they've done to us, but rather that we let things go, that we that we go from hatred or anger or frustration to compassion, um, that we start to care about the other person rather than holding against them the things that we see, that we perceive that they've hurt us or they haven't cared about us enough or they haven't valued us enough, um, but rather that we would say, God, you love them and therefore I love them. And I will forgive them. Lord, help people to use wisdom as far as restoring relationship with people, but help them to have forgiveness in their heart uh, for those who have offended them. Uh, we just pray for that for all of us. We thank you for the forgiveness that you've given us that we did not deserve, that we can have relationship with you because of your bloodshed on the cross, Lord, and your resurrection, proving that you will make all things new, including us. In your name, amen.